All right, so this video is going through the proof of Cantor's theorem, which we discussed briefly in class. Uh, as a reminder, it says, given any set A, there does not exist an onto function f from A to its own power set. So um, remember, this really should be interpreted as, you know, there's no bijection from A to its power set. Um, so there's, you know, certainly a difference in sizes between these two sets, um, and really more more importantly, it's saying that, you know, if I give you a set and take its power set, it's strictly bigger. Um, and if I continue taking more and more power sets, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger still, right? So this is how we sort of talked about different levels of infinity. So different sizes of infinity, each bigger than the last. Um, so for, for the sake of, you know, having a sort of grounding for the proof. So um, we'll think about this with a finite set A and then the power set of that set I wrote down. So A is three elements. Uh, power set should have eight. So I think I got all eight of them. And think about any function you'd like. So, you know, you maybe can immediately see that, you know, no matter how hard you try, you're never going to have an onto function from a three element set to an eight element set. You're going to miss, you know, at least five elements, right? Um, but, you know, for the sake of having definite things, let's pretend that, you know, I gave you a function f um which is going to map one to the set one two two to the set three and three to the set containing two okay so again right i'm mapping input numbers to outputs which are sets right um, so it's important to remember that the outputs of this function f should be sets that's element from the power sets the set of subsets okay um great so um keep this in mind as like sort of our canonical example um, but remember that really Cantor's theorem is going to work even for infinite sets, okay? So where it's a little bit harder to do this. But okay, let's start going through the proof of this theorem, and we'll, we'll back bounce back to the example when we need to, sort of, sort of to help with our intuition. Um, but as, as usual, right, to, to show something does not exist, let's assume to the contrary that there is such an onto function and then see where it goes wrong. So let's assume to the contrary. that um, there exists an onto function f from a to its power set. OK, great. So how does how does Cantor's previous theorem relate here? Like, why? Why do we sort of group this theorem together with previous theorems? Well, remember when we proved uncountability of R, right? It was also a contradiction. Basically, what we did was to say, well, suppose we, you know, R was countable. Suppose we can enumerate anything. And then I'm going to build a brand new number that is not in the original enumeration. So we'll sh we basically showed that what we created um, this new number was not part of our list. The function actually wasn't onto, right? The, this enumeration, right? So we're going to do the same thing here. We're basically going to make a set in the this codomain and show that it never could have been hit by our original function f, okay? So we're going to consider a special set. So consider a specific set b. And there's a very specific definition of B. And it's a little bit bizarre the first time you see it. So it's the set of all A in A such that A is not an element of its image. OK, so what does this mean? So here's what you're going to do. One by one, look at every element of your original set A. Now that gets mapped somewhere under F, right? So it gets mapped to a new set, right? And then you just ask yourself, is that number A inside the set that got ma it mapped to, okay? If it is, you leave it out of the set B. If it isn't, you put it back in the set B. So let's go back to our example up here. So the set B, okay, in this case, what we want to do is look at the numbers one by one. So I look at the number one in A. Is it true that one is an element of its image? So is one in the output of 
its image. So it gets mapped, one gets mapped to one, two, and yes, one is in that output. So because one is in its image, right, set, um, I don't want to put it in B. So I don't include one. Uh, what about two? So I look at two. I'm going to ask the same question. Is two an element of the thing it maps to? Well, two maps to the set just three. And so no, right? So two is not in this set, which means I will put it in my set B. Uh, same thing for three. Let's look at three. So three maps to the set two. And if I ask, is three an element of, uh, sorry, F of three, sorry, is three an element of its image? Well, the image is just the set two. And so no, three is not in its image. So I will include it in B. So in this case, the set B that I create is the set two, three. Okay. So again, right, the idea is B is exactly the numbers from the set A who aren't contained in their own image. Okay. So the thing that you should notice about the set B that perhaps is coincidental, but it actually isn't, is that the set that we created, of course, is a subset, right? It's, of course, an element of the power set, but it is also something which is not ever represented over here. So you see two, three is something in my power set, but it, it was one of the things that I happened to have missed um, under my mapping F. And so you might ask, is this a coincidence or is this always the case? The answer is this is always the case. So what I'm going to do is even for this general setting where I have you know this F from any A to any power to its power set, let's convince ourselves that no matter what this set B is never going to get mapped to okay so let's let's see why so um since f is supposed to be onto there should be a z in the domain such that f of z maps to that set b right if this truly were an onto function, as we assume, then there should be something like a Z, right? That outputs exactly this set when I plug it into the function F. Okay, that's what it means to be onto. Let's see why this is gonna cause an issue. So this is gonna end up being a contradiction. So there's two cases to consider. So here's case one. I want to ask you the question, is Z an element of B or not? Z itself, okay? So first, if Z is an element of B, right? Because B is just some subset, right? So like Z is one of the numbers and it may or may not be an element of this set B. So if B is an element of, Z is an element of B, sorry. If Z is an element of B, then by definition of B, so I'm looking at this right here, right? we must have, or it must be true that, so what did I just highlight? A, not element of F of A. So I'm talking about Z, right? So this is Z, not element F of Z. But wait a minute, we know F of Z is B, right? I mean, let me just replace this, like this is equal to this. So that is, me saying z is not an element of b but i just created a contradiction right i just said well if, if z is an element of b then i conclude z is not an element of b that's a contradiction okay so that that can't be the case so this is a contradiction okay well so then we must be in case two which is so if z then is not an element of b So if Z is not an element of B, then, well, again, I know B is the same thing as F of Z. So let me just replace that. So then Z is not an element of F of Z. Okay, that's just re renaming B as F of Z again. Um, but, but wait, so if Z is not an element of its image, 
that is exactly what it means to be inside of B, right? So by definition of B, this means that Z is an element of B. So that means if Z was not an element of B, then it is an element of B. And that's another contradiction. Ah, so therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. So if Z were an element of B, then it's not an element of B. If it weren't an element of B, then it were. So no matter what, no, no matter what case you give me, there's always a contradiction. So all of this couldn't have been correct. All of this tells me that actually, no, our contrary has been, our contradiction has been reached. There is no onto function, right? So no matter what, so no matter what case, oh, that's interesting. No matter the case, we arrive to contradiction. Thus, it must be the case that no onto function exists. We're done. So this is a very like mind boggling proof in a way, right? It's very tricky what's going on here. Um, but there is a really interesting connection between the set B and sort of what happened here to a very famous um, uh, sort of paradox, uh, which is called Russell's paradox. Uh, so all of this that we're seeing here is all of this is related to this idea that comes from what's called Russell's paradox. And Russell's paradox, one way of stating it is the following. So there is a barber in a town who shaves every, exactly the people who don't shave themselves. So they shave exactly the people who shave, don't shave themselves. And so the question is who shaves the barber? And so the barber can't shave himself or themselves, right? Because if they shave themselves, then, well, the barber is supposed to shave only people who don't shave themselves. So that's not going to work. But if they don't shave themselves, then the barber is supposed to shave exactly people who don't. So then they do shave themselves. So, right, this is the problem that if you try to say that they do or don't, you sort of run yourself into the other case immediately and you get a contradiction. So this, this idea is known as Russell's paradox. Um, and so, yeah, so this is what we, we see happening here. Okay. So a very, I don't know, very creative and a very sort of uh, good exercise for the brain type of proof here, right? I mean, I think this is a very good logical sort of exercise to think through and understand all these steps. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in class.